Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If I could uh, get you to grab a seat if yeah, there sure. are any yes. left. And uh, what I'd like to do is thank, uh, thank you all for being here today. This is our uh, December Mitchell Institute uh, Forum, the uh, last one of uh, the year. Uh, and I'm uh, proud to say that 2018 was a, a year of uh, uh, great growth for uh, Mitchell Institute, thanks to uh, the support from uh, many of you uh, in the audience. Uh, and there's a reason the room is crowded today, uh, and that's because of our guest speaker, Major General Mike Fantini. Uh, he's the new director of the Air Force's Warfighting Integration Capability, AFWIC. Uh, and said another way, Fan Man and his team are charged with helping ensure key decisions regarding investment choices, policy decisions, and overarching priorities uh, represent an enterprise approach across the Air Force. Uh, what a concept. Uh, for too long, you know, we've approached things in stovepipe fashion. Uh, and many of us uh, here in this room have tried to get the Air Force to move toward uh, a much more uh, enterprise-wide approach, and that's exactly what uh, AFWIC uh, is doing. Now, I've long been fortunate to call Fan Man a friend, but for those of you who don't know him, he's an F-16 pilot by trade. Uh, I don't hold that too much against him, uh, being the world's greatest F-15 pilot. <laughs> he's commanded at a variety of different levels, and he last served as the Director for Global Power Programs in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition. So with that, Fan Man, the podium is yours. Great. Thanks, sir. <laughs> So every time we get kind of that sparring going on, I, I just like to say, whether it's with a sister service or something, anyway, jealousy and envy are ugly emotions, okay? <laughs> so that'll kind of give you a flavor of the talk. So um, I'm happy to go wherever you all want to go. And uh, so I have the great privilege to be the director of the Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability. Um, and heck if I know... Uh, why I got selected to do this. Uh, and I want to thank publicly Clint Crozier, right, for standing up this over the last 18 months and getting it to the point where we are today. And my first impressions of only 10 days or so, or I guess a little two weeks, whatever it is, um, uh, are that we have fantastic people that are tasked with work in tough problems, and, and, and we have a tough mission in terms of you know, balancing the ability to solve world hunger in terms of, of boiling the ocean and integrating across this enormous enterprise that we call the United States Air Force. And then, oh, by the way, the Office of Secretary of Defense and the Joint Staff are also interested in understanding how the Joint Force integrates better. And you've heard General Goldfein say on any number of occasions, it's about joint and combined ops. Uh, and, and, and so just scale that up again. And so uh, my analogy or uh, an example I'll use is I became the director for global power programs, took after uh, Major General John Norman. Uh, and as I walked in, he had 70 odd programs across the nuclear enterprise, fighters, bombers, munitions. And, and uh, I, my interest was not necessarily in the individual programs, but my interest was always as the director of global power programs how do these things work together better? And not just within that portfolio, but what's the network that we're going to connect to? Why are we buying SIMs, 28 types of SIMs, or why are we paying for 28 threat replications, or whatever the you know, true example is, but it's representative. And so my interest was always like, hey, we need to go talk to the A3, who's in charge of the uh, operational training enterprise or infrastructure on SIMs. And, and understand why they're doing what they're doing. And let's figure out how we can leverage this stuff together better. And that's not a normal acquisition practice, right? Because my the acquisition J-O-B is to go out and acquire. Uh, and so I was trying to push my folks in acquisition to think outside the proverbial box a little more to kind of make sure they're going and talking to, you know, the A-9, the A-3s, the modeling and sim folks, uh, uh, the Navy, God forbid, the Joint Strike Fighter Office, these types of things. And so, uh, and lo and behold, as I watched AFWIC stand up, 
uh, I, I was always very interested in understanding, and this dates back to when I was a, what I'll call snot-nosed colonel, uh, working in A5R for General Mueller at the time, and then General Scott, General Jones, Honez Jones later, of, of how do you do cross-portfolio trades, right? Cross-portfolio trades, it was, if, if, if one MDS is red and the other MDS is green, okay, we should trade. Maybe the risk has got to be yellow across the board. But for whatever reason, in the process that we uh, chose to execute, and that was under the core function lead concept, we, we had a tough time teeing up for leadership the ability to trade across these portfolios. And a fr great friend of mine who works in A5R, Doc Ellis, Dave Ellis, he and I have constantly lamented this issue. So now I own it. <laughs> and... Uh, and so uh, that's our charge, right? Our charge is to integrate across the enterprise. But first, we also want to be out there looking at and figuring out what are the design choices or what, are, what, what should be the enterprise design of the Air Force? And then from there, how do we integrate better across the Air Force? And so, yeah, that's a pretty tall task. But... Uh, we're gonna eat the elephant one bite at a time. I'm not gonna try to boil the ocean and I'm not gonna tell you that we're gonna turn the, the iceberg, you know, anytime necessarily soon, right? Okay, we're gonna be pragmatic about what we take on and that's gonna be based on how we are onboarding our capability uh, and you know, that translates to manpower uh, and the human capital aspects of it and we're gonna be realistic with what we uh, tell the chief and secretary, obviously. The reality is, is there's no turning room for the chief and secretary at Endgame. And a buddy of mine who was the, uh, the planner, 8X, a couple planners ago, you know, gave an initial brief to the leadership and, and he says, uh, well, you have about one to 2% of swing weight. <laughs> and, I go, and I go, how'd that go over? And he went over and you know, there's all sorts of humorous jokes you can kind of tag on to that. It didn't go over very well. And so that just continued to highlight, you know, and, and every chief and secretary have had this challenge in the Air Force. I mean, shoot, General Keyes, you've lived this. Uh, General Jumper stood up the craw, and then through changes of leadership, the craw kind of capability requirements risk analysis, I think it was. Uh, I've already talked to Mike Snodgrass, who has offered his assistance and kind of the vision. So anyway, uh, our mission is to, uh, to drive these design choices experiment, prototype, war game that to understand what reality is, and then look to integrate across the Air Force. And so I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, how, we're, how we plan on doing that. And really, more importantly, uh, I'd rather get your questions, and then for the tough ones, I'll give the General Fay, right, for the boss. Uh, and General Fay and I have been uh, friends and, and professional colleagues for, well, shoot, our entire career, but really uh, over the last really 15 years. So it's kind of neat. So I'm going to go to the, the next slide first. And so this is the Venn diagram of how AFWIC plans to uh, conceptually pull this together, right? And so if you look at this, and it's very similar to what the chief presented at AFA, but it has a little bit more detail in terms of what we're trying to actually do. And then I'll go back and I'll show you the organization of, of how we're doing it, okay? And so conceptually, we're in the middle where we are integrating across these uh, portfolios to understand where is technology and innovation taking us, uh, what are warfighter requirements, and then how do we bring this uh, stuff together in the center? And so this has heavy play with the MAGCOMs, the major commands, this has heavy play with the acquisition enterprise, uh, and obviously it has heavy play in influencing and trying to direct the eventual planning and where the money meets the road programming of where we're going to put resources for the United States Air Force. And then we're going to scale it up to ensure that we're in line with where OSD and, and, uh, and the joint staff plan to take us. And so I think we're going to make a lot of money 
in terms of, one, pushing the envelope in terms of force design. Once we understand what that is, looking at cross-functional teams, and our cross-functional teams are different than the Army's, and I'm not going to give you an Army pitch by any stretch of the imagination, although I think they've done a, a, really, neat, uh, a really neat way of, of organizing, and I've previously spoken with then Major General Jim Richardson, now Lieutenant General Jim Richardson, who I understand is going to be the Deputy DCOM, of, or is the DCOM of Forces Command out at, uh, I think it's in Austin. But, uh, but these cross-functional teams, and uh, this is where we want to push to get small empowered teams that are knowledgeable, okay, across the enterprise. And really, we're not going to be able to do it all in AFWIC, you know. I don't have Af Air Force Cost Analysis Agency costers, you know. I have some analytic capability. I have some m marginal costing capability. But we have professional organizations that do this for a living. And so we're going to many times have to matrix across. And so it's kind of like we're going to be the, the conductor of the proverbial orchestra to bring these teams together to look at these various problems. And so that's what the cross-functional team will do. And then we're going to leverage all these things you see on the left side, right? So blue horizons for, you know, big brains, folks that are younger, that have more and more appropriate thoughts that are more and more appropriately connected to the technology enterprise, you know, give them a tough problem and see what they come back with. And I also have this concept and analogy, and I, my previous vice commander knows this, uh, Om Prakash, uh, uh, captains and staff sergeants have the answers, period dot. Captains and staff sergeants have the answers. My son, a cadet, a, a junior at the Air Force Academy, we, I want to give him a tough problem. Uh, those folks have the thoughts and the neat things of, yeah, easy, easy day, we can do that. And that's the problem is kind of, you know, working our way through that frozen middle por portion. So captains and staff sergeants have the answers. And so Blue Horizons giving them tough problems. Working with uh, Speedy, uh, the Strategic Development Planning uh, and Experimentation Group out, out under the Air Force Research Lab uh, to kind of identify what are the S&T things that we should push, right? So we can identify these things and help pull them through the proverbial valley of death. And it's really to focus on why we, we shouldn't have 100 activities. We should probably have 30 activities, right, or whatever that is, to focus on what's important for moving into these advanced concepts into the future. And, and, and the measure of merit needs to be effectiveness, right? We continually go through this standoff stand-in. Well, everything needs to stand in if you're going to create an effect on a target, right? I don't care if it's a cyber effect. It needs to stand in, okay? So we have these arguments over stand in and stand off, but the reality is it's the means with which we plan to accomplish the mission. And you have to be effective. I'm not a big safety guy. I'm more about effectiveness. I'm inherently safe if I'm effective, okay? And so the stand off, stand in argument is it's, it's just as long as you're effective, so there's a myriad of ways that we can piece the force together, and we're looking at that right now, and we're taking this opportunity to kind of look at design uh, concepts, uh, alternatives that we're calling them, and we've kind of tabled four of them. And we're going to look at these four concepts and war game them, figure out when and where and how the S&T is going to deliver. And I guarantee that probably any one individual alternative is wrong, but inside each one of these alternatives, you know, there's pieces and parts that we're going to pull out that eventually are going to be some kind of hybrid. I bet you. Now, I, that's Fantini's intuition. Sir, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it'll not. But the first alternative is what we call the baseline, right? And so we have rolled out, the secretary rolled out uh, effectively this preview of the 1064 report that's going to go over to Congress that is tied to 386 operational squadrons that we believe for the Air Force we need. So that's, you put a gun to my head today and you say, how many, how many squadrons do you need today? And I'm gonna say 386. I'm gonna fold like a card table in resistance training, right? <laughs> um, but that number's 386. And then you have kind of the, the pacing units associated with that. So that's our base case, baseline case. And then we're gonna go look at, okay, 
if I fight with the base case and I'm able to do it from when I have base resiliency and I'm, I'm going to fight in, in, inside certain threat environments and what have you, that, that's the second alternative. The third alternative is we're just going to do it all from standoff, right? We're going to do it all from standoff. How does that work? And then the fourth alternative is something more um, uh, disruptive on how you're going to use loyal wingmen, how you're going to take low-cost assets, and, and those types of things. And so when we war game across those four realities uh, and experiment with pieces and parts of that, that's where we hope to see and develop a new force design, or the reality of a, of a concept of a force design, right? And so we're going to set that vision, and then it's going to hit the reality of the planning and programming pieces, right? And so, in my humble opinion, the difference between what your vision is and where you're trying to go compared to what you actually execute, that you're going to have to figure out what the risk is there, and, and is the leadership going to be happy with buying that risk? And so our job is to help inform that. And so uh, this is how we're going to be organized, and we're working towards that. Let me go to the next slide to show you. No kidding, because many folks are like, what is AFWIC? Okay, well, we are building. So we hit initial operating capability, I think it was March of last year. Um, and I'll tell you, people can promise you the world and then the reality of getting billets, which is moving along well, but getting the human capital and the timelines, because folks aren't going to uproot their families and move. And so the reality is we hit IOC with about 60% of the butts and seats that we had planned, and we're executing our job, okay? We are continuing to, to flow billets over to get to what we're going to call IOC plus, and eventually we're going to uh, plateau out and I, I believe uh, the number we have is about 260 is the game plan of where we initially plan to go. Uh, I'm not saying we wouldn't grow past that, but right now the game plan is going to be about 260. And we're working all the personnel actions, which, you know, I know my retired friends in uniform or former friends in uniform know is, a, is, a, is an immense challenge. But, so if you think conventionally, and unfortunately, I, and I told the chief and the vice this, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure you, you picked an innovative thinker here, but I can solve a problem for you. So we have organized across about six different directorates. And then uh, we are looking to onboard eventually Five Eyes Joint Coalition, par or pardon me, Coalition Partners, uh, which is a work in progress. But we want to be dovetailed in because the number two pitch in the NDS, the number two line of effort is building alliances and partnership. And you know, who better you know, than to do that with the UK, Aussies, and, and arguably uh, anybody that wants to play. Um, so uh, we are looking at innovative solutions. Now, your, your question might be, hey, General Fantini, lay out those innovative solutions for you. Well, we're in the works in many of these uh, areas, okay? Uh, but we're, we're focusing, but I'll tell you where our weight of effort is. You know, future concepts and designs. What's the blueprint of the Air Force? I've got an immensely, amazingly sharp uh, Air National Guard Colonel, uh, Torch Aman, who is leading our blueprint design. Capability development, that is tied very closely with A5R and going to the Capability Development Council to get various pieces and parts and concepts approved. And then we have uh, data uh, decision analytics. Like, you know, uh, like I said before, the measure of merit to get on the team should be effectiveness. Now, there's varying levels of folks that have opinions on effectiveness and what have you, but it needs to be underpinned with an analysis. And so we have an analysis division, but in my humble opinion, our analysis division is going to need to be tied to our A9. Uh, it's going to be need, uh, it's going to need to be tied to CAPE. It's going to need to be tied to Lincoln Labs, Sandia, Johns Hopkins, you name it, MITRE, uh, in terms of validating, you know, kind of we get our homework assignment. I want, I personally want a good stamp of approval from s these other organizations because, again, it needs to stand the test of time, right? It needs to stand the test of getting thrown into a bureaucracy, frankly. And then we have a support division. 
And here's where I, I talked about the functional integration. So these would be the areas that we uh, are planning to build out a cross-functional team. Now this looks a lot like core functions, okay? But if there's a problem, let's take position, navigation, and timing. So position, navigation, and timing affects virtually every one of these. So we have a PNT team that stood up as a cross-functional team, and so we're gonna pick pieces and parts of various areas and pull this t matrix team together to give the, you know, the problem of what's our position, navigation, and timing strategy for the United States Air Force, and then how do we plan to pursue that, and that's, that's ongoing. Uh, we stood up a team for C4, we stood up a team for networking, we stood up a team for position, navigation, and timing, um, <clears throat> and we have obviously uh, game plans to build out teams into the future. Okay, and that's where we are still building out. Okay, by no means do I have the person power, the human capital to fill out all of these boxes on, on the slide. And so that's kind of the big picture of how we're organized. So really, um, let me just talk about some of the things that we are uh, working towards as well. So advanced battle management system, you know, okay. So I'm not just merely talking about replacing one major weapon system, right? Inside that advanced battle management system, you've got to get the architecture correct up front. You know, we need an open system so that folks that want to play, we, in five to six years from now, based on how quick technology is evolving, you all know this, we don't know necessarily what widget or what concept or what waveform someone might come up with, but that thing needs to be able to plug in, you know? And so if you get the enterprise architecture correct, then these other pieces and parts can be worked. And so that we, we have an interest in ABMS from that perspective. Um, regarding multi-domain command and control, ABMS, AOC Next, all these things, right? We are going to aggressively partner with the acquisition community as Dr. Roper brings on uh, an architect to, to meld this in. And, you know, you saw the Venn diagram before. We are going to have to be very closely aligned with the acquisition community, whether it's from an ARL, AFRL, Air Force Research Lab touch point, or if it's hardcore system program office work where we're uh, developing these types of things. Resilient basing. You know, it, it's about generating combat power. And that generating combat power in various scenarios is a challenge. And that's okay. We identified that we have that problem and we're gonna figure out a smart way to fight through that. I grew up in an Air Force with Alto where we, we had to flush airplanes out in 15 minutes, right? You know, we all did that back in the day, most of the folks in this room. So getting back to that concept of fighting through uh, an environment uh, where we're not in a permissive environment that we've enjoyed for any number of years. I talked about PNT, uh, the future of hypersonics and directed energy. You know, I, we, we, we want to push to get there. But I'm also very pragmatic in my examples, and it's really neat to have General Keys here because I kind of go, uh, there are these guys named Keys and Jumper who worked together as captains in Vietnam to figure out how to drop the Domer Bridge with a laser-guided weapon. That was like 68, 69, 70-ish. Well, not till 1990 did laser-guided weapons become more than just a niche. And then they built out in the 90s, right? Because only 10% in Desert Storm 1 were laser-guided weapons, right? Same thing with GPS. They began in the 60s. It didn't get called GPS till 73, it didn't go IOC till 95, you know. So these epiphanies in technology that people think will just kind of turn on the dime, that might happen, but I'm more pragmatic. But that does not negate the fact that we have a technological revolution going on here in information and the ability to, to, to bring things together in a multi-domain environment. And so from that air, space, and cyber piece, and then scale that to the joint and combined fight. Uh, that's no, that's an immense challenge, but it's, it's doable. I was talking to a gentleman on Friday, getting a pitch on a base defense capability, 
And I said, hey, what's the deal with multi-level security? Because we've heard in multi-level security, you know, it's kind of like the Kobayashi Maru, right? It's, it's just so tough. And this guy's going, oh, sir, easy day. We just scale up, scale that, we do this. And I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't able to hang with him. But we'd have to prove it. But this young gentleman who is an expert in software started up and started down a couple companies already. And he's like, oh, yeah, we can do that. And he, and, he, and he used our lexicon. He goes, Nipper, Sipper, Jaywix, what do you want? We can do that. Okay, so th that's where we need to move, in my humble opinion. Uh, and obviously the chief, the secretary, um, and we have any number of our senior leadership that are, that are on board with that. So with that, I'll, I'll just close to say uh, I'm, I'm, really, <laughs> I'm really excited. Everybody's like, you're going to go do this on the 18th? I'm like, hey, I got the new guy card. Yeah, I just bought it. I'm still, you know. I don't know the answer to that question, and, and just uh, let's move on. But from a passion to integrate and make things work better uh, together, uh, that's always been something. And my other goofball analogy that I have is I see things in the gray. I wake up in the morning and I see gray. I'm not a one or a zero person. I'm always kind of like, well, you know, we could probably work that out. Let's figure it out. And so I'm about getting people together and giving them a hard problem. And then uh, generally the test is correctable at 100%, right? because we're going to continue to iterate on, on, making it, on making it better. And so with that, uh, I'll take any questions you have, and, uh, and uh, off we go. So, sure. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about, sort of go into these, the four concepts a bit more, how they differ from A, each other, and B, Today's Air Force, mm -hmm. uh, not just in size, but it sounds like in a very much in you know composition and con ops. Uh, that'll probably keep you busy. Uh, just that answer for a while. I have many more right. questions, but that's start. I'll start with that one. So you know you can answer any question with three answers, right? It depends. Can't use the second one. You can ask me later. Yeah. It depends. <laughs> a, a lot of stuff, and then and then fifty mils. Um, so. It is a little bit of a boiling the ocean question, but I, I, we're developing the con ops kind of right now. We have four teams stood up that are looking at, well, pardon me, uh, A9 was the team that established the baseline, alternative one, so that's kind of done. Alternatives two, three, and four, we've stood up a team for each one of these, um, and they are working to figure out, you know, what technologies do they think they would need, where are the mature? Where are these technologies mature? Uh, and we're working with the A9 to have them do initial analysis on do we think these may or may not produce. Um, and so, uh, and and we only have stood this up. I think it's only the last two three months. You know, so it's going to take a bit of time, and we're going to get some initial reflections off of that, and and we'll share that with our leadership. And, and how we're going to kind of morph or recommend a morphing of any design. But, it, but, we're, but it, it's going to take, we need the analysis to understand, you know, how does a disruptive technology really affect where we've already, we already have a pretty massive investment in kind of the, the force we have. And so the tyranny of maintaining, not, it's, not, it's the tyranny of dealing with, right, the current investments and then figuring out how we can leverage that to make them better in the future. So I, I, I can't give you any specificity on any particular one. But to, 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 to boil it down for, 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 for the dumb ones, it's basically the four are basically 386, lots of standoff, lots of stand in, and let's get funky with, with unmanned. So you can, uh, let, let's think about it as baseline, uh, uh, is the second term legacy? Legacy, uh, evolutionary, no, pardon me, pardon me. Baseline, evolutionary, revolutionary, and disruptive. You can kind of think of it from those four categories. Yes, sir. Jack Catton from Boeing. Follow up on that one. You're very familiar with um, what industry can offer in terms of modeling, simulation, experimentation, and analysis. Do you anticipate the AFWIC leveraging some of industry's capabilities to help you with the analysis? Yes, absolutely. How we do that, I'm not quite sure, you know, and what kind of budget we have to play, you know. Um, but my, I just was sitting down thinking through some things. Just, I think we should invite 
um, folks in uh, for, you know, here's the tough problem day. And, and I know that industry, I hear this all the time, we don't understand or where and what the Air Force wants. So I want to help communicate that, which I tried to do as the director of global power. Um, and to give you the tough problem, and then come on back with what you think the answer is. And, and, I, and I want bigs and I want smalls uh, doing that as, as well. And you know we had the opportunity to do that exercise uh, in, uh, over the summer where I had uh, various, various, cap or various industry partners come in and kind of provide some input, which was very helpful. Yeah, we'll go in the back first. Just yell from the diaphragm. Hey, sir, uh, thanks for your words. Lieutenant Colonel Grant Mizell, uh, Air Force fellow over at Georgetown University. Great. And uh, A5R alum. Nice. Um, so yeah. uh, uh, kind of a uh, structural question. Um, with uh, I I'm really excited about AFWIC, breaking down the stovepipes, coming up with new technology. But with the MAGCOMs who still own uh, the, the requirements process, the 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 Magicom still have their money, they still do the AOA, they have all the expertise, and quite frankly, they have a four-star advocating for their stuff. What structural changes do you see the Air Force needs to, uh, to be able to, to break through those and, and grab a solution from a different stovepipe other than the one that Magicom is advocating? So, um, I think there's a, there's a bit of advocacy that I need to kind of peddle, if you will. Like, I, I need to have relationships uh, and I have relationships with many of the MAGCOMs already um, across the portfolio, whether it's General Raymond, General Holmes, General Ray. Um, uh, I happen to have just worked for the incoming Air Force Materiel Command Commander, General Bunch. Uh, and and uh, so I think, uh, and you know, General McMurray and I get along swimmingly. But more importantly, I'm, I'm able to, I think, reach into the, the staff elements uh, pretty aggressively. Uh, and that's why I think the chief wants, a, wants two-star two horsepower to kind of convene. And so my folks will come to me and say, hey, uh, this is what we want to do. And I go, great, give me a note. Because when I say we're going to go sit down and have this engagement, the staff will have a tendency to listen. You know, so there's this element of synchronization and, uh, and relationship. So, but, you know, I'm going to retire someday. I'm not going to be around forever, you know. Uh, so we got to build it on a little bit of the process word uh, so, that, so that it survives uh, my tenure. So in terms of what structural changes we're making, we're standing up AFWIC, right? ACC, uh, they're, 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 the 40 billets are being transferred from ACC up here. We're still working on the uh, human, <laughs> the heartbeat in the seat, right? Uh, and that has occurred across the staff. And so that is the structural change. And then we're going to kind of take a temperature of the organization, I think. Are we producing anything of value? Because, like I said, a weapon's got to be effective on a target. afwic has got to be effective for what the chief and the secretary have tasked us from a vision perspective of what our mission is, enterprise design and driving integration. So that, my answer is we're standing up AFWIC for the structural changes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. All right. David Isby, Air Hi, International. David. To build on that, the other question is you, talk, you are here thinking in functional integration and concepts, but we still fund line items. How are you going to get congressional large buy-in to this sort of approach? and associated with money because ideas without money tend to turn to smoke. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, that's an easy question. <laughs> um, but, it, but it's the same thing. I, th I think we gotta be transparent with what the plan is, right? And because, so there's this element of pragmatism of the reality of what we're actually doing. I think we need to be transparent with that. So, as an example, I'll use the 804 authorities that uh, Dr. Roper is, is really driving hard in the acquisition community. And so part of that, uh, and he would say, it's actually harder to execute an 804 program from the fact that you want to make sure that the people that are supporting you, i.e. Congress, from a resource perspective, 
they get regular and prudent and accurate updates to keep them up to speed because you don't want them to be surprised because that's just not a recipe for success. So I would say from the same perspective, you know, uh, we in the integration side of the house and in the, in the concepts development side of the house, we need to be transparent as well. You know, got to keep our bosses informed, right? But I, I don't want my boss to do that work. I, I want to be able to kind of take that off their plate. And so I think there's this element of, of engagement and transparency. Now, that, there's only 24 hours in a day and, you know, we're going to, again, it's got to be balanced with reality and, 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 and pragmatism. But I would say, you know, this is, the, this is the challenge, right? This is always the challenge of how do you unleash yourself from having to do your daily J-O-B, right? Deployed operations, continuing to maintain nuclear, strategic nuclear deterrence, running the space constellation, and then getting to the future. So that's where, you know, I, I said, we're gonna set these design concepts to try and push to go there, and then it's gonna hit the reality of the planning and, and programming elements. And so that's where we'll end up balancing things out, right? Um, and so that's where I, I'm not gonna promise you the sky, and I'm not gonna promise to boil the ocean, but we'll promise to make progress. So, so let's go in the backpack just for grins. I hope, did that get to where you wanted to go, David? Uh, good morning, sir. Thanks for being here. Rod Atkins, Deloitte Consulting. Earlier, you talked about the digital revolution, and I'd like to ask a question more about cultural barriers and how much, uh, how pervasive technology has become in the public space and how much I'm able to allow technology to make purchasing decisions on my behalf and help clean my home, things of that nature. How pervasive do you see and how ubiquitous do you see that type of digital airmen uh, in the Air Force in the next maybe three to five years? So that's, uh, that's where I would say our leadership has a vision of pushing to get there. And, and we want to enable that. Um, so I was at ITSIC two weeks ago. I was amazed at what could be done and what is being done today at it, at, at the model, in the modeling and simulation enterprise. Just amazing. And, and that's what we have to kind of, we want to get to that, right? We want to ensure that our research labs and or <coughs> Uh, the Sandias of the world and those folks are providing solutions that are leveraging that type of capability. And so we're starting to see a lot of that, frankly, uh, with Pilot Training Next. General Fay and I were talking about he's going to set up his own Pilot Training Next setup for his daughter, who's a high school and, or a, a senior in high school. I, I'm like, yeah, that's really neat. I'm like, I'll take her flying. Do you, ah, I don't need that. I'm going to do this. <laughs> no, but we're going to go fly. No problem. <laughs> so, and some of the folks in the room have been flying with me. Uh, but yeah, so I, I can't give you the specificity of what, but what we're trying to do in the innovation area uh, is find an experiment and then can we take that experiment for base defense as an example and just understand how we may be doing base defense, but then if it's an open architecture and can take input from any sensor, okay? So nominally, you know, we're, when you're talking about fence lines, you're talking about kilometers. And, you know, folks are going, well, we can go 10 to 20 kilometers. I'm like, I want 1,000 to 2,000, right? And, and that's okay. That can, and he goes, oh, yeah, well, it's just an input. And I go, can you take FAA radar feed inputs? Yeah, yeah. could you take uh, some type of uh, radar sensor, other radar sensor input? And so, you know, conceptually, you can. So I'd like to, to get there. And then at the tactical level, or very tactical level, even in, you know, training, uh, where, when I was the Shepherd Wing Commander with uh, Colonel Prakash there, uh, you know, we were beginning to see uh, the Air Education and Training Command under General Rice allowing students to train at their own pace. Take your iPad, here's your issued iPad, go train at your own pace. You know, and then we saw it in our, our, our own training environment down in our various training squadrons at Shepherd. I think General Quas has taken that and put it on steroids, you know. And, and that's where we need to continue to push. So I think you're gonna see these pieces and parts and pockets, and it's gonna kind of success, will continue to beget success, I think, in that perspective. Yes? 
Hi, sir. Uh, Courtney Albin with Inside Defense. Um, I had a, a two-part question. Um, mm -hmm. First, uh, Congress has asked for some uh, specific um, fighter force structure numbers. I think they're due early next year. Um, to what extent is the uh, war gaming that you all are working on going to produce that um, some of some of the numbers they're asking for there in yep. that time frame Great. and then the second question um, I, I think there's been some frustration in the past and maybe still that the Air Force um, can not always provide immediately the numbers that Congress asked for in terms of aircraft inventory needs is the idea that is part of the idea that some of what you're working on with this model might allow you to be able to answer that question more quickly in the future and, and pull some of this together more quickly for them so the answer to your question is 386 and yes. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot packed in there. So nominally today, and this, and General Wilson said this, I think last week or two weeks ago at the Reagan Forum or in a venue, uh, and it, uh, what this 1064 report has allowed, and we're also having C C C B CSBA, CSBA and MITRE are doing their own independent report. Um, but it's a lot, what's the strategy? Ready and lethal, partnership and allies, reform the Department of Defense, okay? Along those three lines of effort, what do you need to win? And the national defense strategy has said, your pacing threat is China, okay? So now we, and so that's where the number of 386 operational squadrons has been rolled out. And that report will go to Congress in, in the spring March-ish, April, I can't remember specifically. Mar March, okay, so this 1064 report they asked about goes over, and that's where this number 386 comes from. And that's like for today. If you said this is what you want, this is what we say we need. We're about 25% too small for what the nation has asked us to do. We're identifying where we believe we need to go. Now, if you, just, now if you think about now our, our design alternatives, so we're gonna try and take the war gaming, the analysis that goes on inside of that, and pull concepts to hopefully drive the Air Force into the future. So let's just say nominally 386 squadrons, just for argument's sake, that that's, that's what we say, that's the need today. Let's go 10 years into the future to 2028. Let's just for argument's sake, make the number easy, let's say it's 386 still, but those squadrons may be of a different makeup you know, long-range engagement squadron, I don't know, software development squadron, digital squadron, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but that's where when we get these concepts, we wanna drive to that change into the future, okay? So that's kind of, so that's the answer to your second part of your question. If that, does that help you there, Courtney? So it should inform Right, so it should inform us on what our design should look like, and then through this modeling, wargaming simulation, how do we change in the future, right? But there's a lot of oh by the ways, and there's a lot of gotchas, and there's you know, any, you know working with the match comps on on how to, how does that occur? So there needs to be, uh, but this is why we wanted to bring it, in my humble opinion, up to the under the Pentagon into the headquarters element. So the chief and secretary are saying, this is where we're going. Okay. Yeah, I'll get you. Uh, good morning, Vivian Mashi with Defense Daily. Thanks for being here. Sure, Vivian. You, you mentioned earlier in your remarks that you've set up teams for, I think you said precision navigation and timing, C4 and networking. Can you share which ones you have planned next and you know, what's the process for choosing this? Is it based on priority or is it based on, you know, the personnel and their level of expertise and areas of expertise that they have? Yeah. Thank you. So um, let me take the second part first. Yes, you know, we, we, we want to match up appropriate skill sets into the appropriate problem. Uh, and then we should have some, you know, some outliers that are challenging assumptions, which is, which is always useful. Uh, and then, uh, I, so uh, probably uh, air superiority 2030 will absorb that in the summertime-ish, uh, which was identified that uh, that is, uh, if you are familiar with General Grinkerwich's work, uh, as I got very intimately involved with that last year, I'm like, this is 80% of the Air Force. 
if not more, because it has all, uh, you know, uh, logistics, basing, electronic warfare, uh, air combat, modernization, all of these things underpin air superiority 2030. Well, th that's an integration task in and of itself. And while we are executing that right now, uh, my good friend, uh, Major General Cooler Crum, Dave Crum, he's got the enterprise planning challenge there that will eventually come to AFWIC as we stand up a little bit more manpower. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Valerie Incena with Defense News. Um, so if I've got this right, all four of the concepts that you guys are looking into have at least 386 squadrons. Is that correct? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Did you guys, are you guys also looking at um, potential, I guess, solutions that the Air Force might need if, it, if it's not allowed to get to 386, if it has to be more pragmatic? And can you talk a little bit about that? So I would say, right, the difference between what I want and what I have is risk. And so I think we would articulate the difference of, so in each one of these alternatives, the game plan is to determine what does it take to win from a proverbial modeling and simulation experimentation perspective. We might come up with a number of 500 and one, who knows, right? But we go, the good, bad, the ugly, it's gonna take 500 widgets to make that happen. Um, but that's where we go, okay, each one, we want to understand what it's going to take from the, from the assumptions in each one of these alternatives to win. And then from there, we're going to have to put on, you know, the various lenses of, okay, this is what it's going to take to win, but I can't afford what that answer is. And then we're going to have to kind of realize what is reality going to be, and then to me, the difference from that is risk, you know. And nominally, I think our chairman has, has given us guidance on moderate risk is nominally where we lie. Okay? Does that help you? Does that help you? I, frankly, I do not understand these four concepts. I, I don't understand, you know, if you have baseline, evolutionary, revolutionary, and disruptive, how do you quantify those four different things? Like, is small sats, does that fall under evolutionary or revolutionary? Just, you know, directed energy? Like Remember, there's th always three answers to any question. <laughs> 50 mils, I'll talk to you later about the second one, and, uh, and it depends. So that, uh, you know, so the answer is yes and maybe, right? So um, I would say that element of, of those concepts are, uh, it, are really just emerging, and that would probably go into the... Um, revolutionary and, and uh, uh, disruptive bucket. But I could easily, I mean, heck, what, NASA launched how many of these small sats yesterday? I can't remember. Was it 12 or 1,200? Come on, somebody listen to NPR with me, didn't you? <laughs> uh, I don't know. NASA launched a rocket yesterday, heard it on the way home last night, and it had a bunch of CubeSats in it. I can't remember the number. Um, but that's here today. That could very well be evolutionary. How many? 13? Okay, 12. Yeah, 12, 13. Okay, great. Yeah, 1,200. Be, don't quote me on 1,200. <laughs> it's on tape. If you print it, it's going to come after you. Yeah, so, okay, so what did it take to do that? You know, I, and then I saw the, a middle school put a CubeSat on a NASA launch SpaceX last 10 days ago or so from when they launched from Kennedy. So that's, that could actually enhance um, uh, the evolutionary piece, believe it or not, right? So I'm not signing up to where we're going to land in any one of those, you know. Uh, but so people will go, GPS, revolutionary capability. Took 23 years to go from when we signed the contract to start it to when we declared IOC. 23 years, okay? So you need to be educated in the reality of of where things, and I'm not saying that, man, I sat in a green room with pilot train, or pardon me, I sat in a green room uh, down in Orlando in a jo Joint Strike Fighter cockpit with goggles on, and I could see my hand touch switches that would do the exact thing it would do in the jet, and then I could see out, and I was in a, a flying environment. It was awesome. 
didn't take 23 flat screens and 23 projectors and all this stuff. Uh, so we need to be able to leverage those types of things and push it in to our structure. But I think, you know, uh, the uh, uh, small sats and cube sats, yeah, we, we definitely want to get there for every kind of int available. I'm not going to tell you exactly which ones we're going to go after first, but uh, yeah, we want I, I, I would love that. I would love that. But it's got to be, you know, it's got to be pushed through the cost effectiveness lens, right? What are we going to get for what we're investing? So, yeah. Uh, good morning, Brian Everstein with Air Force Magazine. Hey, On Brian. your planning and simulations, does that take into account the Air Force's share of the space mission set will stay about the same, or are you planning for the creation of a space force? So I think, you know, the reality of the space force and what that becomes in the future will we'll accommodate that. Um, but it doesn't, it does, you know, th that space force and how we transition into it th absolutely does not negate, you know, where we want to go from uh, leveraging capabilities in space and, and, and really getting and maintaining that high ground. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Lauren Williams with Federal Computer Week. I want to go back to the CFTs a bit and sure. see if you can talk a bit more about what problems specifically the networking team is working on. <sighs> yeah. So, uh, I wish uh, the, I got to play a little bit of the 10 day new guy card, but uh, they're really looking at getting at an enterprise architecture. And we will team up with uh, the technically smart people that do this kind of thing for a living. And that, uh, and that, to me, that's the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, that's Dr. Roper in the acquisition community and how we pull that together. Um, and, and I'm not promising, um, again, I don't want to boil the ocean in, in that perspective, but we're really looking at kind of from an architecture perspective, how do to, how to things play? Yeah. And that's tied in with advanced battle management and, and what have you. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi. Good morning, sir. Major Sean Rickame, uh, National Guard Bureau Air Staff, Hi, ISR Ops. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about stovepiping and working with the acquisition community. Are you looking at ways to leverage solutions that one PEO or one program office is putting into one particular MWS, and if it's compatible and a good idea, leveraging it and integrating it into other MWSs? So th the, the big picture answer to that is, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so what does that look like? Um, I don't, I don't have a specific example for you. Uh, but uh, my time in the acquisition community, which is actually, I used to be an AQL back in the day, and then, and then uh, I got the opportunity to be an AQP. And one of the things I learned at our weapons systems reviews, and the PEOs are, are challenged with the proverbial stovepiping because they've been given a JOB. But the beautiful thing is that they've identified the fact that they need to be identifying cross-cutting issues and who's going to be that advocate. That's going to be us. But when you get to a specific widget or capability, yeah, we're going to kind of try and identify that. And then, you know, I notionally would work with the acquisition community to kind of go, hey, did you guys hear about this? Which was kind of what I was doing in my previous job. To, to cross cut into uh, uh, AQI, which was this kind of the networking acquisition uh, side of the house, AQQ, uh, which is doing trainers and simulators and that type of thing. Does that make sense or helpful? Okay. Colonel Mosby, you don't have a, a question? <laughs> I just. I got a lot of dirt on people in this room, so you better be gentle on me. Good morning, sir. C.D. Smith with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, supporting the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force for International Affairs. Right. You mentioned that in the construct of your AFWIC staff, you will be having members of the Five Eyes included. Also, the NDS calls for us strength, uh, to strengthen our alliances and attract new partners. Yep. Will, as you look at the force design, will you be including the capabilities of partners and allies 
And also, are we looking for actual capabilities or access? So I'd say uh, capabilities. I would, I would land on the capabilities side of the house. And I think through that, you're going to just naturally end up with access. And our, uh, our closest allies and partners, uh, as you know, uh, <laughs> there are some folks that have moved out. And it's kind of fun to sit in a briefing with a partner and they put on their slide secret no foreign. You know, that's kind of, and I'm, I get a chuckle out of that. And I'm like, yeah, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So uh, I think it's going to lie score, most, most specifically in the capabilities perspective. Uh, but there's some partners that are outpacing us in some capabilities, which I think we want to identify, come to Jesus with it, and leverage it. And they're willing, to, I think, to do that. We have a lot of frozen middle we need to work through uh, on, our, on the DOD side of the house. But yeah, we're going to take that on. OK. Yeah. To uh, come around for another pass. Uh, Thanks. Uh, you, you, you mentioned the CFTs, said they're, you know, the Army's ones are good, so these are not quite like the Army's. So give me more sense of what they'll look like. You know, I've covered the Army ones. They're sort of supposed to be this blend of requirements people, acquisition people, mm -hmm. S&T people, uh, you know, led by a war fighter. They pl the, the idea is they sort of short circuit all the bureaucracy they have for there. The Air Force has a little bit of bureaucracy of its own. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, who are the people you're bringing together on a, t on a team, uh, you know, and how, what are they going to be you know, plugging in back to home organizations? Are they going to belong to you? Are they going to be a mix? Uh, you know, what, what's, your, what's the competition? So I would say, uh, yeah, so I, I would say it's going to be a matrixed team with the core team will probably be 10 to 12-ish. And, and then we're going to, you know, let's, we're gonna, let's say we're going to work on some space capability. Well, it would be kind of silly for us to not engage with General Raymond's team and experts there. Um, and so it's going to be a matrix capability. So I got to do an exercise over the summertime to lead an effort to review a capability. And, uh, and I was terrified, but I, 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 I lined up the Air Force Red Team. I lined up AQL. I lined up AQR. Uh, I lined up the A3. I lined up the A5. And we all came to an engagement and with 25 folks or whatever it was. And we set a battle rhythm. We had a problem, we set a battle rhythm. We established suspenses and we produced an output. I'm not saying you're gonna like the output, but we pr we'll produce something. So that's, so I'd, if, if you put a gun to my head I'd, and said in one word, it'd be a matrix organization. Are they gonna have like, programs they're gonna try to be advocating for, like the armies are gonna be a little bit less directly linked to acquisition? So it has to be uh, linked to acquisition because we got to have the knowledge of what's going on already in the space. And then is that going to suffice? And or how does it morph, change, or is it complemented from other, other areas? Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, yes, sir. John Fantini. I think everyone in here would agree with me after hearing you that you're the right person at the right place at the right time for this job. And uh, we appreciate you taking we'll the time for uh, sharing with us your perspectives at this early date. Yeah. We have a little something for you. This being the last uh -huh. month of 2018, the 100th anniversary of the close of World War I, uh, <laughs> you, they, we did have airplanes back then. And so this is a book about uh, the first American fighter squad in the Lafayette Escadrille. And given the mm -hmm. amount of time that you have, it's got lots of pictures, so you can That's look right. it over. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very sir. much. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, on behalf of the Thanks, Mutual folks. Institute, we'd like to uh, wish everyone a very uh, merry uh, aerospace power kind of Christmas. So we'll see you next year. Thank you. <laughs>